How's it going, everyone? Welcome to Roll On Gaming. And today, we have a really special guest. We are so privileged to be joined by one of the designers of Star Wars Unlimited and one of the creators of the Twin Suns format. Joe O'Neill is here, also known as Hyperspace Joe. Joe, thanks for taking the time. Hello, hello. Good to see you. Good to have you on. And before we get going here, I just have to know, Hyperspace Joe, how did this come to fruition? Where did you get this nickname? I think that was a John original. Um, while we were playing Twin Suns um, in its very early forms, uh, I put entirely hyperspace cards in the deck, and it just kind of stuck from there. John has given me maybe 50 nicknames, but that's the number one. So because you were doing early testing and putting all these hyperspace cards in the deck, you could be the original person of this entire game to bling out fully your deck. Is that yes. is that fair to say? Okay, great. That's awesome. Probably is true. Yeah. So you now have that important distinction and that's and Hyperspace Joe was born. So we love it. Uh so we're definitely going to talk about it. We're definitely going to talk about Twin Suns um because it's a really exciting format and I'm sure folks want to hear a lot about it. But I have to start um asking you about, you know, coming to Fantasy Flight Games. I mean, you yeah. went to college just a stone's throw away from the office where you now work. I mean, what was your awareness growing, you know, growing up and getting into your career path about FFG and the possibility of making a career out of game design? Yeah. Uh, growing up, um, I of course had heard of FFG games and FFG studio, but I was really surprised to hear that they were so close um, to where I went to college. And uh, when I saw the position opening up, um, I jumped at that first thing I could get. I wouldn't have had to move. It's a dream job. And now here I am. And now here you are making an awesome Star Wars game for all of us to enjoy. So you started in April of 2023, which is coincidentally right around the time it was uh, the game was actually going to be announced to the world, um, yes. you know, being announced in May. So where... Tell us, tell us a little bit about your introduction to Star Wars Unlimited and like where the game was when you started and, and how you were sort of brought up to speed on that. Yeah, so there were four of us who were brought in around the same time, um, April or May or so. Um, when we came on, set two was in its kind of final phases. Set one was completely wrapped up and we were getting just ready to announce the game to the wider world. So a lot of us up applied for this position not knowing exactly what we would be working on and when we heard that it was Star Wars Unlimited and got to have our hands on it for the first time we all just kind of fell in love instantly um I'm going to steal a quote from one of my fellow uh developers MJ but they always talk about when you start at a game you don't know if it's going to be like exactly your style or not and every single one of us were like oh this is my game so what made it your style like what what about the game really spoke to you was it the star wars aspect was it the the design was it all of the above like how did you how did you come to the conclusion of of just exactly what you were saying like wow I, this is i'm fully locked in this is my game <laughs> yeah um I've loved TCGs for pretty much my whole life, and I was very excited to be working on one, but not only just a TCG, one with a really cool IP that everyone knows and loves. And then two, this game really is, it feels like something special. There's so much mechanical depth. Um, there's so much quick surface understanding. I've played this game with my wife as her first ever TCG and she picked it up so fast. Um, first few rounds went a little easy on her and then by the end she'd beat me because I went behind too much and she grasped it that fast. It was It's a blast to play. Well, that's good to know because I'm definitely going to be teaching my wife Star Wars Unlimited yeah. here in just a, a short while. So it's good to know that it can be picked up just that easily. And really, it's a it's 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 a game that's designed to be picked up easily. Uh, the mechanics are... <laughs> are such that they're simple, but the the decision points are super deep, and that I think gives it the depth. Have you have you had that experience as well? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's so interesting how that does constantly keep coming out in this game, where you have this moment you're like, oh, if three actions ago I had swung on this unit instead of the base, then we wouldn't be in this predicament, and then you'll remember that for next time and get better and better at those decision points. But in the moment, it just feels like, especially when you're new, you're like, 
I'm not quite sure which. They both seem good. And I love that about the game. You're always learning how to play it better and better. Well, you're you're obviously not new anymore, but as you were getting familiar with Star Wars Unlimited, mm-hmm. you know, and figuring out what you liked about it and you know, set one is at its completion by the time you uh, get hired at Fantasy Flight Games. How do you then uh, become enamored with double cunning in set one? Because I think you've said previously that that's that's your go to pairing for Spark of Rebellion is is cunning, cunning. How do you land on that as you're as you're uh, becoming more familiar with the game? Yeah, um, I think what led me to that is the card cunning itself. It's so much fun. It's so high impact. It can do everything you want in one turn and just completely change the board state. Um, reading that card and playing with that card a few times, I'm like, I have to put this in more decks. And the only kind of deck it can go in is double cunning. So unless you want to splash it, but that's a different story. Yeah, I, I'm very impressed with the power level of that card. And and I think that's one that everybody sort of agrees is in the top tier of of not yeah. just not just legendaries, but cards in general in the first set. So. I'm excited to see how much work that card does. So let's let's talk a little bit about Twin Suns, right? Because this is this is this is your baby, for for lack of a better term. You you mentioned the team of four, yourself, MJ, John, and Ryan. Uh, yes. You're all sort of tasked as you come in with helping to create the multiplayer format for Star Wars Unlimited. And, and I think it was MJ who said previously that Danny Schaefer, the lead designer, had a set of prototypes and notes about what multiplayer might look like. And you guys were sort of asked to polish those up and and turn those into the, the format that we see today. Can you talk a little bit about those early prototypes and some of the discussion points that were being had surrounding those as the as the format started to evolve? Yeah, of course. Um, well, one, I was talking to Jeremy about this the other day and just how it has evolved a little bit. And from day one, they knew they wanted a fun multiplayer format in the game. Um, you can see it in set one cards that will say each opponent instead of just an opponent. Um, they were been planning this from the start. And because the team was so small at first, uh, we didn't have all the time and dedication yet to make that format until we brought on all the four new people and from there we were able to take a lot of the early notes from danny or jeremy or tyler um about tenants that we really wanted to keep one being um the game end state we really don't want that feeling of the game is over and i'm sitting around for an hour waiting for my friends to finish playing um and we tried the game that way and it is not as fun and then we tried the game with the current end state rules and it is one so much more fun and two you get to watch for just the right amount of time in the most exciting phase of the game so it's been playing really well yeah as somebody who plays a lot of games with my family it's it's really nice to see that you know if i get eliminated early i don't have to just sit there and and wait for you know go go get a snack go you know something you know see what's on what's on tv while i wait for the game to end (laughs) Um, so that's been really fun. Um, and, you know, you talk about sort of going through the things you wanted to keep. And 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 I, I'm interested because when we found out that the multiplayer format was going to be called Twin Sons, I think a lot of us, myself included, assumed that it was going to be like a two versus two, almost team format um, yeah. for multiplayer. And obviously you didn't go that route and, and the end result speaks for itself. But yeah. I'm wondering what what sort of challenges did you face in considering a two versus two or, or, a, or a team type of environment um, that were unique to Star Wars Unlimited that led you to settle to uh, with the free-for-all format? Yeah, for sure. That is, um, that is a good question. We all just tried the free-for-all format and found that it is what played the best. It was what felt the most dynamic and the most fun the most free deck building options. Um, I can do my own thing and not worry about a partner. Um, I can bring pretty much any combination to of colors to the table and it will play pretty well. And it's a pretty self-balancing format with the four player free for all. If any one player starts getting ahead too much, everyone else is going to knock them down. Yeah. I look, I I can't complain about your guys' decision because it looks 
super fun and I can't wait to try it out myself. But you mentioned deck building. I want to mm-hmm. expand on that a little bit because there are the two facets of deck building that really set Twin Suns apart from Premier, and that's mm-hmm. the two leaders and the singleton format, allowing only one of each card in your deck at this point. Mm-hmm. Which of those deck building rules or constraints, however you want to view them, do you think really expands the card pool the most? I mean, I think they both do, but like, which one have yeah. you found in playing the game has has? Do you think that's really expanded it and made it more um, accessible? I think the two leaders of those two, um, they both have heavy impact on the game. I think the one of every card rule increases the variance a lot in a way that does make the game constantly fun every time you play it. But the two leaders has so much impact between giving you an entire other aspect um, that you are not allowed to have in any other version of the game that just cracks things wide open. And then in addition to that, having two leaders that can combo off of each other, um, one leader treating another leader as if it's a unit, like Grand Inquisitor readying a leader is such a crazy gameplay uh, mechanic that... I feel like it opens up the gameplay so much. Yeah, it's that's that's so hard to fathom. It's you know because we're all used to the premier format, and mm-hmm. you know you only have the one leader out there. But the fact that you know you could potentially have Director Krennic with Grand Inquisitor, I think that yeah. was Xander's pairing on the live stream. And, yeah, it's a favorite combo. And you're restoring four and and hitting for five uh, on the the when they both deploy. It's <laughs> it's wild. It's wild, and so. Grand Inquisitor and, and Krennic is is a pairing that you know we've seen. We've also seen you um, in a hero p- a pairing playing Chirrut and Hera, and I want to know yes. what what drew you to those two leaders as a combination that that you because you played that on stream as well. Uh, and so what yes. what about that pairing do you like, and when what strengths does it have? Yeah, so if you watched that stream, you'll know it didn't go great for me, <laughs> but that's fine. That's part of the fun of the game. Um, I really like that pairing because Turret himself is one of the few leaders that you can pretty reliably expect to be alive by the next turn you take. If you have a big deploy and everyone gangs up on you, um, Turret will still at least get one swing in, unless John plays Force Lightning against you <laughs> and you lose true. all your abilities. Yep. Um, so I love to just stick a bunch of upgrades on turret and be the big threat at the table i think that it can be impactful but it also paints a giant target on your back which is not always a good strategy in twin suns but it's the most fun that i've had playing it and then Hera is there to make turret even bigger with her deployability as well as be another large stat uh rebel unit that can synergize with a lot of set one cards yeah, I, I think you said it best, you know, uh, making yourself a threat, maybe not the best thing to do in Twin Suns as you experienced. Yeah. But hey, if not for that Force Lightning, which was a one of, you yeah. know, that would just happen to be a lucky draw. No, I just, I fear Force Lightning, I fear Bamboozle, and most other things I can deal with. Um, it just happened that there was run right next to me, so. So we've got Grand Inquisitor and Krennic on the villain <laughs> side. We've got Chirrut and Hera on the hero side. You've done you've done a ton of Twin Suns testing. What are some of these other leader combinations that have just hit the table in your testing that have that have cleaned house? Sabine Han, which I think was also on the stream is another popular one. The dream of the turn one deploy if you start with a uh resupply in your hand is amazing. Um again, not very consistent because of the singleton format. But that is also part of the fun is like, am I going to live the dream of this game? Um, I think Chewy is quite strong in Twin Suns. We had a game where the little space unit that Chewy had put out as a Sentinel at the beginning of the turn and everyone kind of forgot about ended up being the difference maker where this player could not be knocked out because of just always having a Sentinel around. And uh, I think that's really cool to see some characters shine in certain ways they do in twin suns that maybe they don't shine as much in the uh single player formats do you find that players who utilize sentinel a lot in twin suns games have an advantage because 
if your opponent has an option to attack someone who doesn't have a sentinel versus <laughs> someone who does they're usually going to go to the path of least resistance and therefore leaving the the sentinel player largely untouched do you do you see that happen a lot or is it more oh well now we have to gang up on the sentinel player and it balances out in the end uh it does balance out in the end um but when the tur the turn the sentinel comes out it is usually very high impact and a lot of people are trying to like build up their own board state and they're like oh, if i attack that i lose this unit so i'm just going to leave it to someone else at a certain point, it reaches a critical mass of like, okay, everyone, we have to deal with this. Sure, sure. Um, so it's not just deck building that makes Twin Suns unique. It's it's also the addition of the two new counters, the Blast Counter uh, and the Plan Counter. And so when you guys were designing Twin Suns as a, as a format, what made the creation and the use of these counters so essential to the final mm -hmm. product? Yes, a very good question. We went through many different iterations of different counters. Um, one, we knew we wanted three counters because this format is best played with four players. And that leaves every player getting one counter except one who just has to pass. And I think that's an interesting dynamic for ending the turn. Um, do I want a counter or do I want to keep moving? Um, the blast counter, I think, is one of the more important ones in the game because we originally started with a heal and the game lasted a half hour longer than it currently does. And we realized, especially with the current game ending rules that we all loved, it turns into a slog at the end where everyone has about five health left on their base and no one wants to be the one to pull the trigger because then if I knock them out, this other person's gonna knock me out. So we needed something to proceed, make the game proceed faster. And Blast Counter came in and it shaved off, I think, 40 minutes off the first game we used it with. Wow. It wow. helped so much and it is a uh, high impact on the board and nice and simple for anyone who grabs it to understand what it does. And the Plan Counter was a way to help address the weakness of a singleton format where you're probably not going to get the cards that you're getting or that you want because you only have one of each in the deck. But if you can dig a little deeper, there's a good chance that maybe the turret player can get that Jedi lightsaber that he really, really wants. So give me your expert priority order. If you are <laughs> the first one that's that's finished of the three or four players that are playing <laughs> and you have the choice of any of these counters, how are you prioritizing initiative, plan, and blast? One thing I've really liked about this format is my answer to that question changes a lot through the course of the game. Unless I'm lucky, I think I do prioritize plan early. Um, mid game, I think blast is really strong. You get to keep chipping away while keeping your health up. And then end game, having that initiative can make a huge difference. If you're the first swing, and you have full resources, you can knock out that one player who's got a little health left, but has a really scary board state, assuming there's not a Sentinel in the way, but yeah. Uh, I, I, that speaks to the versatility of the three counters is at some point in the game, every everyone provides a different impact, which is great. Um, so now you've put all these things together. You have the deck building rules, you have the counters, you're you're reaching the, the point of, of final approval with twin sons mm -hmm. what what was the moment where you guys are all around the table and you just you something happens and you you look at each other and you say this is it this is our format i think that moment happened many many times um i can't point to a single one but like the first time i surprised people with the giant turret was a great moment um MJ was the first person to discover the GI and uh, uh, Krennic combo and them waiting to deploy both leaders until like way later in the game and all of a sudden healing everything off the base was such an exciting game ending play. Um, we've had several like that and I think that speaks to how fun this format is, is that we kept feeling it over and over. That's awesome. That's awesome. And, and so... Now, now the format is completed. You put your stamp of approval on it. Yeah. How many sets had been put in the can and, and, and fully completed by the time you guys were 100% were happy 
with where Twin Suns was? Uh, set two was pretty much ending approval and set three was just kind of picking up steam okay so during that initial testing we did a lot of um games with just set one games with set one and two games of one two three um trying it out making sure it feels good across all the different sets and yeah it always has it's just been always fun to play and so with you know, only really two sets fully finalized by the time Twin Suns comes around. How has the creation of that format influenced card design, right? And how many, how, how have you had to sort of shift your thinking on cards for future sets as they relate to Twin Suns? Yeah, I think the biggest change is that every once in a while we'll look at a card and be like, this should say each opponent instead of an opponent. Give it something a little bit extra and special for twin sons um we've thought of cards that play really really fun but maybe aren't the strongest in single player and that combo ends up being way stronger in twin sons so we might opt to keep a card that feels very special in that format around um that said pretty much any card can be used in either format and that's an important goal of us we don't want anything to be too siloed as the the game goes on so let's talk about the future right so it's been it's been announced previously that with the release of set four uh which was not complete by the time twin suns was created uh that the minimum deck size is going to go up to 80 cards in your twin suns deck and so one of one of each for 80 that's that's a ton um which sounds awesome um, but also that's going to make that, I feel like that's going to make the plan counter even that much more useful at that point. Um, mm-hmm. What else have you found in your testing of 80 card decks that <laughs> that makes it a different game and makes the change necessary besides the fact that there's just more cards? Yeah, so the obvious answer is more variance, which is great. It's an important goal for this format. Um, two, depending on who you are, it might make deck building a little easier. I often am sitting there going, God, which of these do I cut? I want to get down to 50, but it's so hard to make that choice. Um, And when you have so many different cards to choose from, that choice just gets harder and harder. I've appreciated the 80 limit because it does make my life a little easier when cutting things down sometimes. But uh, yeah, I think those are the two biggest. Awesome. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely looking forward to to 80, but I I can't look that far ahead because I just want... I just want set one at this point. So, um, yeah, but I'm excited. I'm excited to try it with 50 and, and see how it goes from there. Um, and then as one of the architects of this format, you know, you, MJ, John and Ryan, where do you hope that Twin Suns permeates at the OP level, whether it's casual or competitive? Like, how do you hope that it's incorporated into a, into official events in the future? Yeah, I think that would be a great question for our OP department. Um, But I do hope that the fans can take this game and run away with it and keep playing it at any different event. We had our community event where we unveiled Twin Suns for the first time. And we had people playing it until midnight that night until, well, I left at midnight. People were still playing beyond that. Um, I would love to see this format getting played and hearing the like laughs and funs and screams from all the different tables at any kind of event where Star Wars Unlimited is being played. Well, I, a little bit of breaking news here. You left at midnight. What's going on, Joe? Like, what? We, we, we weren't trying to stay up till two in the morning playing Twin Suns? No, I was, uh, <laughs> I was tired and I had a dog at home to take care of, mm. but uh, I could have sat there and played all night given all the resources in the world it's so much fun it's such a blast and it's great to play with the community well as a as a dog owner myself dog takes precedence i understand completely yeah yeah, of course um well look we're all really excited for twin sons we're obviously excited for spark of rebellion to come out in very a very short amount of time by the time yeah exactly so uh are there any final thoughts that you want to share as we approach the release that um that you're excited about or that you're looking forward to the for the community to experience i'm really looking forward to seeing what the community can put together for especially in twin sons what leader combos that we haven't tried that someone thinks of and makes a crazy deck with that's been some of the most fun in this game is just constantly seeing new play patterns emerge and being like whoa that's so cool 
Well, I, I hope that we can uh, that we can impress you in that regard, uh, because you and all the other members of the design team for Star Wars Unlimited have certainly impressed us, uh, and we're all really excited to try out this game. Um, so thank you so much for everything that you've done, and thank you for your time and being here today. And we really appreciate it, and you're welcome to join us anytime at Roll On Gaming. Of course, and thank you, Kevin. This has been a blast. Um, I'm happy to talk about this game anytime. Awesome. We will hold you to that. Thanks, Joe.